Wesley Zerkirk, D U R K I T. Please take a seat, state your name, spell the first and last name, and then court order. It's Wesley Durkett, W-E-S-L-E-Y-D-U-R-K-I-T. Where do you work? Uh, University of Georgia Police Department. How long have you worked there? I've been there since 2012. What are your duties and responsibilities there? Title is an IT security analyst. Uh, I'm also an officer with the department. Uh, I serve as the <clears throat> lead digital forensics examiner for our investigations. If you could adjust that microphone into your mouth, I just want to make sure that uh, they can hear you over there and Madam Court Reporter can hear you, okay? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, um, security, let's say that one more time. IT security analyst. Okay. And I'm an officer with the department and I serve as the lead digital forensics examiner for the investigations. What is a digital forensic examiner? Uh, specialized training uh, and role to uh, specifically examine any kind of digital evidence, computers, cell phones, any kind of electronic storage medium uh, to support uh, the investigations. Tell the court a little bit about your training and education. Uh, education, I have a bachelor's degree in management information systems, a master's degree in information technology. Uh, I've, I'm a post-certified police officer, so uh, Georgia standards for uh, peace officer certification. Um, I have gone through specialized digital forensics training uh, starting with the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center in Glenn County, Brunswick, Georgia. Uh, I've completed the eight-week curriculum there uh, to go through courses and certifications in mobile device investigations, digital evidence acquisition, uh, Windows computers uh, analysis, and Macintosh forensics uh, analysis for Mac computers. Um, I've completed vendor-specific training for the tools and uh, analysis software that we use in our unit, uh, specifically with Magnet Forensics and their Axiom software for analysis. I'm a Magnet Certified Forensics Examiner. Uh, what was Gray Shift uh, for the Gray Key device, uh, for the use of the Gray Key device to extract and analyze cell phones, uh, Gray Shift is now owned by Magnet Forensics, well, that's why I say it used to be Gray Shift, um, <clears throat> as well as the Compelson uh, Mobile Edit Forensics Pro software, uh, which is a specialized software and analysis uh, that's uh, specialized in uh, wearable devices, smartwatches, uh, and stuff like that. Were you asked by your department to uh, do two things? Number one, extract data from a cell phone that belonged to Lake and Riley, first of all. I was. And were you also asked to extract data from a Garmin watch that she was wearing at the time of her murder? I was. And did you do both of those things? I did. I'd like to start first with the extraction of Lake and Riley's cell phone with Gray Key. Tell us what is Gray Key and what did you do to her phone? So Gray Key is a uh, specialized device. Um, it was specialized and created to access uh, iPhone devices originally uh, that we were not able to obtain access to. So it has specialized capabilities to be able to unlock iPhones. Uh, in this case, we were provided with the passcode for her phone, so I did not have to use the force unlock feature of it, uh, but it still has advanced features within it to obtain as much data as possible from the phone. Uh, so we used it, uh, extracted her phone, uh, and then entered all that into uh, Magna Axiom for our analysis and reports on her phone. Okay. Let's start. I'm going to hand you a few documents. Let's do it all at once since I'm up there, but may I have one moment? Okay. 
What is 268? Uh, 268 is the uh, it's a flash drive containing the uh, gray key extraction data of uh, Lake and Riley's iPhone. And did you learn that yourself? I created this flash drive myself and handed it to you. Thank you. And uh, at this time, Your Honor, the state would move to admit the state's 268, but as with the previous phone extractions, we are not asking the fact finder to consider all of the data on this phone. There is a separate PowerPoint presentation that will be done by another witness, and that will be the data extraction for the phone, for the fact finder to consider. 268 is merely for the record. Do you, any objection? No. It will be admitted for those purposes. 269, what is 269? So this is a flash drive containing the extraction of the Garmin Forerunner watch um, used and created by the Mobile Edit Forensic Pro software uh, extracted directly from her watch. That report was copied onto this device by me and given to you. And the state would move to admit states 269. 269 is admitted. Did you create smaller reports from 269 of the Garmin data watch? I did. And how did you do those reports? So from the extraction of the watch, uh, we get basically the entire dump of data. Uh, so I was able to pull uh, data points uh, from the last run uh, that was being tracked on her watch. And I entered all of that data into the SPSS analysis software, uh, which is just a statistical analysis, produces charts and uh, data analysis uh, visuals. And uh, the Garmin, did it collect her heart rate? It did. Did it collect her speed? It did. And did it collect her location? It did. The location data, was that also sent to the FBI for their analysis as well? It was. I want to talk to you about states 270, 271, and 272. Do you recognize those documents? Uh, I do. These are the charts that I created. From, the, from Lake and Riley's Garmin data? From the Garmin watch data. Your Honor, at this time the state would move to admit 270, 271, and 272. Any objection? Thank you. 270, 271, 272 are admitted without and objection. May, uh, would the court please toggle over so we can publish those documents? May, if you, if you have a difficult time seeing that, let me know because I can come back up to you. Okay. Can I you have a copy myself as well. Oh, you have yeah. a copy. Yeah. Do you have a copy of 270? I do. All right. Can you see states 270? I can. It's a little hard for me to read, and I'm afraid to touch this thing to make sure. it zoom. Your Honor, can you see states 270? Okay. And uh, defense counsel, can you see 270? Yes. Okay. So in states 270, can you tell us what we're looking at here? Uh, so on the top graph, uh, that is charting the heart rate logged by her watch. Um, this is from the time frame of 9, 0, 8, and 30 seconds uh, on February 22nd, 2024, until the time 9, 15, and 30 seconds. Um, and the bottom chart is graphing the location uh, tracked speed um, of her movement during that time frame. And why did you break it down into just this basically seven minute time frame? Uh, simply for visual purposes. Uh, during the entire run that was logged on her watch, uh, it tracked a data point every second that day. Um, so there were over 33,300 data points set uh, and recorded and extracted. Uh, so if we put that entire data set in a chart like this to fit on this one piece of paper, it would essentially be a flat line. So we. Uh, basically just select a time frame that shows some pertinent data. That way we can visually see uh, the, the peaks and valleys uh, included in the chart in the data set. So in, in looking at States 270, can you tell us, first of all, what was Lakin's speed and her heart rate at, at 9.08 a.m.? So at 9.08 Right at the start, okay. Yes. <laughs> it's hard to read on mine as well. Uh, so heart rate at that time was 156, so that's beats per minute uh, for the heart rate. Uh, the speed was at, uh, and it tracks in meters per second, to be clear. Uh, it's 2.65 is what's logged on the chart. Um, for conversion's sake, uh, that'll go over to 5.9 miles per hour. 
and for running purposes that's a 10.2 minute mile. What about the next data point for speed, which is 2.97? Is that faster than the previous one? Uh, that is uh, moving faster than the previous data point. Uh, so 2.97 meters per second. Again, uh, it comes down to up to 6.6 .6 miles per hour, or just over a nine minute mile. And that particular speed, 2.97, is that the fastest that you see on her run that day? The fastest was right at the beginning of the run. Uh, so it's around just after 9.03. Uh, you'll see that on the States next. 271? Correct. Yeah. So, so her fastest was uh, 3.45? 3.45, 7.7 miles per hour, uh, about a 7 minute 47 mile. So going back to States 270, we were at, is that at 9.09 a.m. that it is at 2.97? Uh, a little bit after that. I could give you the exact time if I had a minute to, to dig through the log, but it's shortly after 9.09. At some point, um, we can continue to go along this track. Okay. Um, but in States 270, uh, did you also note uh, at the time that Lake and Riley called 911 from her phone? Yes. Uh, and the, that's the vertical reference lines you see. Uh, those are, yes, those are uh, reference lines that we pulled over from uh, the phone log data. Uh, so at the time the 911 call was placed, uh, that was at the actual call went out at 9:11:06. That's that third vertical line you see on the graph. That's when the call went out. But did she attempt to make it sooner than yes. that? Yes. So I want to talk to you about two things. At some okay. point in State's Exhibit 270, did Lake and Riley come to a complete stop? Yes. What was the time that she came to a complete stop? So the speed went to zero. I think that's notated on the third. Yeah, so on the third chart we have here, uh, two, seven, what, two, is that what it would be? Uh, it comes to a complete stop. Oh, nope, sorry. That was the heart rate. Um, how about states 271? Yeah. Uh, you. Sorry. I thought I had it written down. Yep, wrong chart. So yeah, 9.10.44 was the time the speed went to zero. What time did she attempt to start making that 911 call? So the phone logged uh, the phone call application. Uh, so the internal phones application started to recognize an attempt to place a call at 9.10.50. That's the second vertical line. So for record purposes, 9.10.40 to 9.10.50 is how much time? That'd be six seconds. No. About 40 or 44? Right, it's 9.10 and 44 seconds, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. So that's the speed zero. Okay. And tell me the, the 911 SOS application. I want to ask you questions about that too, but tell me that time. So the SOS, uh, we initially saw that occur at 9.10 and 39 seconds. And right, that's so, not referenced on this chart. Okay, so how, how much time differentials between those two events, from the time that she comes to a complete stop and the time that she does the SOS function? So the SOS function was actually initially applied prior to coming to a stop. Okay, so um, tell but, us about that. So I'm just um, looking for the time between the two. Right, All right. Uh, and I'm just trying to figure out exactly from what point you're talking. All so right. yeah, 9, 10, 39, we saw the SOS feature on the phone initially be activated. Um, and by activation, the phone is just recognizing some way of, to initiate the SOS. Um, there's multiple ways to do it. Um, long press uh, on, or two button side press, so a side button and a volume button. You can long press that, it'll initiate. Uh, from the lock screen, you can hit the emergency call and it'll bring up a dial pad. Um, then there's other features that have to be enabled that we did not see enabled on her phone. Uh, so when you see that SOS folder created at 91039, uh, we believe and we understand at that time is when we saw the SOS starting to become manipulated. Um, then what we see after the speed went to zero with the phone call app intent to call, that's when the phone application is starting to recognize, hey, I need to start waking up to place a phone call. So from the 91039 when SOS was activated, to 91050 when the phone application recognized you're looking at 11 seconds from those two points 
the 1050 was six seconds after she stopped. So that was the phone call being, the phone being recognized that it needs to place a call occurred six seconds after she came to a complete stop. And then the phone call finally went out at 9-11-06, uh, which would be, what's that, 44, 20, mental math, 44, 54, 22 seconds from the speed zero to phone call out. So it took the phone a minute, so, well, not Correct. even a minute, a few yeah, seconds yeah. to recognize the SOS mm -hmm. function and actually make the call. Right. Um, do you have a, uh, do you know how that works on an iPhone to, do you, to enable an SOS function to make an emergency 911 call? Yes. Can you show us if I hand you my iPhone on the stand? Mm -hmm. Show us how that works and you can show the court. All right, how, so, how do you do that? so from the lock screen, we would swipe, you get your unlock dial pad, the and then from here, oh, sorry. And then from here, you would get the emergency button at the bottom. Hit that, and that will load a dial pad. From there, you would dial 911 and place the call. It's one way. Okay, what's the other way? That's the most familiar way for most people with their phone. So from an iPhone, you can select the side button and a volume button, hold, and it brings up the emergency option from that phone, from that display. And so for the record, did you hold the two side buttons down simultaneously? Correct. For that screen to appear? For this screen to appear. Okay. So that's one way. Then if you let go, you'll feel it vibrate. It vibrated in my hand when it brought this screen up. You would slide to place the call. Then on the newer iPhones, hers was a 15 Pro Max, so the latest at the time, if you continue to hold, it will then start a countdown. Um, and it'll go eight second countdown and then it'll start vibrating, uh, sounding an alarm and then place the call automatically. But you have to continue to hold after this screen displays for it to do that. So there are a few ways that Correct. you could do it. Correct. Do you know from an examining, thank you, I'll take my phone back. Uh, do you know from examining Lake and Riley's phone which method of SOS 911 calling she used? So from what we have seen and been able to determine, uh, it appears that the dial pad was used. And I want to talk to you about uh, her heart rate continuation. So okay. I'm going to show you back to States Exhibit 271. Can you tell us the top graph? What does that depict? So the top graph in red is the heart rate uh, data. Uh, and that's from the time 9.03.42, uh, which also occurred, uh, coincided with the beginning of the tracked activity being the run. Um, and it runs to 9.33.59. And again, this is February 2nd, 2024. When did her heart rate drop to zero? So it went to zero at 9.28 and 23 seconds. And did it remain zero? And I want to show you 272. Tell us what we're looking at at 272. So 272 is the heart rate from that same beginning time, 903 and 42 seconds. Uh, and it's tracking all the way to 1259 and 59 seconds, February 22nd, 24. And at some point we see the zero at 928, like you told us. Mm -hmm. And then we see what looks like her heart rate going back up at 1237. Yes. Yes. What, so does that coincide with the CPR? That coincides with CPR and is tracked uh, based on the body cam footage from our officer arriving on scene. So if you look at Officer Maxwell's body cam footage, which we've already looked at, Correct. at 12.37 p.m., he, he attempts CPR on Ms. Riley, is that That's right? That's correct. And that caused, you were able to see that in the Garmin watch? Yes. All right. Between the 9.28 a.m. and when Officer Maxwell shows up at the scene, is there any movement in her heart rate? Uh, no. Her heart rate zero. Correct. All right. May I have one moment, Your Honor? Yes. Good afternoon. Um, I really just have a couple questions to clarify something. We spoke on the phone a few weeks ago, right? Mm -hmm. Um, just for the court reporter, if you don't mind. 
Uh, yes. Thanks. Sorry. Um, and I thought you told me then that you you thought that the 911 call had been placed not through the keypad but through the. Correct. So in further analysis, finally following up with some forensic consultant solutions with Magnet Forensics, uh, where we use our analysis software. Uh, we were able to find some, some more detailed information in the, it's called a P-list, which is just a stored data file um, that's holding all of this data. Um, and we found the setting in there uh, that determined that the uh, multi-press that we were originally thinking was, uh, that feature was actually not enabled on her phone. So then a little bit deeper analysis into what was actually loading at the time, we could see that the dial pad for the emergency call was loaded on her phone uh, at the time that the, the call was being placed. When did you find this out? Uh, two weeks ago. Okay. So at, obviously after I spoke to you. Mm -hmm. And um, but okay, so uh, caught me by surprise because I'm going by the report that I guess was prepared um, back. When did you first do your analysis? Uh, we initially started working this at the uh, initially right after, um, so February. Because in that report, you indicated that at 9, 10, and 39 seconds, the call was begun through the SOS process. Well, the SOS uh, application feature set was activated. The phone call did not occur until that, that 9, 10, okay. and 50. Um, but in any event, you, you, your opinion at the time was that it was not made through the keypad. Uh, correct. Okay. Um, and then... I also asked you, and maybe you know, have more information now, but I asked you on the phone that um, if you could tell who disconnected the call, and you said you weren't able to tell. Not able to tell from the device. Okay. Um, and I saw in your, in your report that's kind of this second by second uh, timeline, you indicated that at 9 11 and 59 seconds, ACCPD 911 center showed the call ended. Uh, that's what I believe they said. Uh, again, I was looking at phone data and just referencing what the ACC data center call uh, provided, um, but I did not scrutinize that, that log at all. Okay, and then you indicate also that at, so one second later at 9, 12, zero seconds, that Riley's phone showed, showed the call. Correct, the phone call, the device log that the call ended. So would that not indicate that um, the call didn't disconnect from Riley's phone's side of it? If the 911 center said that it ended at a, a 9-11-59, I would, my opinion would be that the 911 center is what disconnected first, and then the phone recognized that the call disconnected and then logged it as a disconnected call a second later. That's all, thank you. Mm -hmm. Did you talk to the 911 call center to ask them if they hung up on Lake and Riley? I did not. Okay. Wouldn't that be better evidence of what happened? Absolutely. Thank you. Anything else, Mr. Donovan? No. Can you be excused? Yes, sir. Um, maybe approach uh, counsel. Yes, sir. Thank you.